Hello everyone! This will be my penultimate video on the Jomon period. It's going to be a short one, but the next video is already recorded. All I need is to edit it, so it will be available in just a couple of days. As for today, I'm going to present a brief summary of the six phases of the era in chronological order. I will touch on a lot of details I didn't talk about in previous videos, Todd, so it's not just a summary. The next video will also be on the shorter side. I will cover the transitional period between the Jomon era and the Yayoi era, and conclude by covering some additional topics. As already mentioned, the Jomon period spanned more than 10,000 years, so it's not surprising that historians have divided it into several phases, each with distinct characteristics. The dates defined for the beginning and the end of each phase are based mainly on the typology of the ceramics and, to a lesser extent, on radiocarbon dating. But when I say defined, I don't mean that they are exact. The dates I present here for the beginning and end of each phase are just one of possible variants. So the six phases are incipient, initial, early, middle, late and final. It all starts with the incipient phase. This phase is also referred by some as sub-earliest Jomon or pre-Jomon. People's lives at this time didn't differ much from life during the Paleolithic. Dwellings were rudimentary and built at ground level, not pit houses. And people subsisted by hunting and gathering food, under a foraging model that involved constant movement, with the possible exception of some camps in the southern Kyushu, where there are indications that a more advanced system was emerging. Unlike their predecessors, these super ancient Jomon already practiced the art of pottery. The pots characteristic of this phase had, had rounded pointed bottoms and were decorated with simple rope marks. In the Fukui cave, pieces of pottery were found that are believed to date back to 10,500 BC. Some consider this day to be the beginning of the Jomon era. At the incipient site of Maeda Koshi, traces of salmon have been found, so it is known that some groups were beginning to capture big fishes. At the Takenoyama archaeological site in Kagoshima Prefecture, the discovery of grinding stones, stone mortars and a small number of arrowheads was reported. Also in the same prefecture, at the Shojiyama archaeological site, two pit dwellings, a fire pit with a ventilation shaft and several earths were found. The camps of the early Jomon period are characterized by their shell middens, into which the Jomon threw what they no longer needed, and by being associated with larger quantities of pottery than the camps of the previous phase. From the shell middens, archaeologists have managed to unearth the remains of fauna, hunting tools, including many arrowheads, fishing tools, such as fish hooks, instruments for processing plant food, grinding stones, stone mortars, and headers, for example, needles. Most of the Jomon camps built in this phase were small, contained 3 to 5 pit dwellings, and were located on narrow ridges on hills. In addition, they did not include storage pits. In many ways, the Jomon of the initial phase are reminiscent of cereal foragers. Binford characterized the cereal foragers as foragers who massively exploit a limited number of critical resources, unlike typical foragers, who tend to be generalists. As you can see, the initial camps were relatively simple, but there are exceptions. In Hokkaido, some camps reach grandiose dimensions. In Akodate, for example, a camp was found which was given the name Nakano B. In this camp, burial pits, flash shaped storage pits, and 546 pit dwellings were reported, and more than 20,000 stone net sinkers were discovered. In southern Kyushu, where populations were already more advanced in the incipient phase of the Jomon period, the Uenoara archaeological site was discovered in Kagoshima Prefecture. This site had 46 pit dwellings and 15 fire pits with ventilation shafts. A series of sophisticated ceremonial artifacts were also found at Uenohara, such as clay figures, pulley-shaped clay and stone ear spools, and jars with necks. 
The blazing progress in southern Kyushu was, however, brutally interrupted thanks to the eruption of the Kikai caldera underwater volcano. By this time, outside Japan, rice was being cultivated in the basin downstream of the Yangtze River. But rice cultivation would only arrive in Japan thousands of years later. This phase is characterized by a population explosion and the stabilization of communities. The gradual warming of the climate and the increase in humidity encourages the Jomon to climb the mountain and set up coastal camps. The transition to a system closer to the collecting pole of the forager collecting continuum is particularly noticeable in the S, particularly Shobo, Kanto and Tuoku. In western Japan, large campsites are rarer. In some camps, the pit dwellings were arranged in the shape of a horseshoe, the archaeological site of Nanbori being an example. In others, the dwellings were arranged in a line or in a cluster. Each house was contained in a shallow hole, at the dirt floor and the roof whose shape helped the di to direct rainwater into vessels, where it was stored. Timber discovered at the archaeological site of Oyabe, Toyama Prefecture, 40,500 years ago, reveals that the Japanese were already familiar with the Watariago Shigusi technique, a technique that was later used in the 7th century to build the temple of Oriuji. The remains found in the shell mounds of the time show that the contribution of marine resources to the Jomon diet was significant. At the Sakatsuji shell mound in Toyoashi, a 4,500-year-old shell processing site was uncovered. At this site, around 55 stone structures, thought to have served as furnaces, were found. Similar structures have been found on six other shell mounds in the Muro region, but the ones at Sakatsuji are undoubtedly the oldest. Given the absence of dwellings on the area, it is believed that the Jomon traveled from their homes for the specific purpose of collecting and processing the shells. The quantities would have been so huge that it is possible that some were dried and used it for trade. And speaking of trade, it is believed that the Jomon of this phase already had contact with civilizations on the continent. The pottery that was produced in Kyushu had similarities to Korean pottery, and around this time, a variation of domesticated pitch, believed to have come from China, appeared in some settlements. And although pottery was the most common art form, the early Jomon also expressed themselves in many other ways. They carved wood, practiced lacquer application, wove baskets, etc. The first object made with jade also dates from this phase, although jade is more associated with Middle Jomon. Outside Japan, at about this time, the great civilizations of China and Mesopotamia were rising to prominence. The fourth phase of the Jomon era is characterized by an abundance of large campsites, especially in the Shubu, Kanto and Tuoku regions. Pottery reached its peak in terms of size and showy decoration, and it is quite clear that many of the pieces were built for ornamental rather than practical purposes. And ceremonial objects began to be used much more frequently than in the previous phases. Experts have also found a large number of axes made of shipped stone that may have been used as hoes for rudimentary plant cultivation. Others believe that they were only used for collecting roots. This phase marks the hottest period of the Jomon era, as evidenced by pollen studies, and this peak in temperature encouraged populations to migrate to the mountains. Another record was also achieved during this phase, the population. From this phase onwards, both the number of people and the temperature began to decrease. One would expect that, with so many people and given the complexity of the communities, large camps, abundance of ritualistic objects, trade networks, there would be a certain social inequality, a vertical hierarchy. But the evidence for this is scarce. Even so, it is believable that the subsistence model of the Jomon people of this phase was positioned fairly close to the collector of the forager collector spectrum. This is that people lived for long periods in the same place, being more sedentary than the people of the previous phases. House structures also increased in complexity, the use of pit houses became widespread. 
Some of the floors were paved with stones, and the difference between the roof and the walls became more distinct. Straw and other similar grasses were the preferred material. Around 2,000 years ago, the Jomon trade network reached an impressive 3,000 kilometers from the south of the archipelago to Siberia. It is known that the Jomon traded the following materials. Salt, shell bracelets, smoked marine resources, obsidian and materials made with obsidian, stone tools, asphalt, amber, jade and objects made with jade, ceramic vessels, ceramic figures, earrings, items made of bone, cinnabar, baskets, textiles and lacquered objects. On the screen I have just presented short texts with additional information about each item. Feel free to go back and read them if you're interested. The most emblematic ceramic vessels of the Jomon period, whose edges appear to have been carved in the shape of flames, came from this phase. And many of the most famous dogus were also built at this time. Despite the ostentatious decoration, the quality of the pottery itself did not evolve significantly. Magatama, which had appeared in the previous phase, began to be used as funerary goods. It was during this phase that female figures with evidence of pregnancy and phallic objects made of stone proliferated. This combined with the discovery of ritualistic objects, such as ceramic vessels shaped like lamps, is evidence that the Jomo spiritual world and religious practices were becoming richer. Outside Japan, at this time, the Indus Valley civilization was rising, and the Pyramid of Kofu, the largest of the three main pyramids of Giza, was being built. From 1500 BC onwards, a period of neoglaciation set in, and global temperature began to drop, causing populations to migrate again, this time out of the mountains and closer to the coast, especially to the coastal area of eastern Honshu. Coinciding with a drop in temperature, the population density also drops, and fewer people means a decrease in the organizational complexity of the camps, which became smaller. This is particularly true in the Tuoku, Kanto and Shubu regions. Giant camps such as the Sanai Maruyama one from the previous phase also became rarer. The decline in population is generally attributed to climate change, in particular to possible periods of resource scarcity. While thought it cannot be said with certainty that this is the cause behind the decline. One thing is almost certain thought. Analysis of the Jomon remains indicates that wars and conflicts are unlikely to have contributed to the population decline. The Jomon period is believed to have been peaceful throughout. One thing that is important to understand, however, is that smaller, less impressive campsites do not imply that Jomon society has regressed in terms of complexity. In many ways, the Jomon community continued to evolve. To begin with, it's possible that the Jomon subsistence system at this stage was still positioned near the, near the collecting pole of the foraging collecting continuum. The Jomon probably didn't regress to become foragers. The houses also evolved from round to square or rectangular. The floors were more often paved with stones and some were even adorned with rugs. Like the houses of the previous phases, they also had indoor fire pits. Castanea Krenata, the Japanese cestnut, became even more essential to the Jomon, both as a source of nutrition and as building material, because its wood is resistant to moisture. Castanea Krenata became the most common material for building houses at this stage. The widespread migration closer to the coast meant that marine resources became even more important. As a result, extremely sophisticated fishing equipment was invented, such as the toggle harpoon as well as new deep sea fishing techniques. With regard to objects, ritualistic and otherwise, there was a homogenization of artistic and religious expression. Disease objects began to show similar patterns of decoration in different tribes. The artifacts found, therefore, display a higher degree of cultural uniformity. The Magatama also reached its peak of popularity here. Stone circles characterize this phase of the period. These circles have been found in various arrangements, but there are two that are most famous than the others. 
The first is called a sun dial and consists of a vertical pillar in the center of a cluster of smaller stones. Two stone circles arranged in this way, called Manza and Nonakadu, were found at the Oyo archaeological site in Akita Prefecture. To build these circles, stones from the Akuya River were, tra were transported 5 to 7 kilometers. The second famous arrangement was achieved by arranging the stones in circles or squares. In Komakinu, Aomori Prefecture, a large stone circle was found in which the stones were arranged in three concentric rings. Some 2,400 boulders from the Arakawa River, 70 meters downstream, were used to build it. Many of the stone circles were found in Aid, mountainous locations, so many scholars think that they served as a kind of astronomical calendar, by being aligned with certain celestial bodies at certain times of the year, such as the solstice or equinox. Some even compared the alignments of these circles with Stone Edge in England. For example, if a line is drawn from the center of the stone circle at the archaeological site of Teranuigashi, Totigi, during the winter solstice, it will mark the sunrise over Mount Tsukuba. From certain circles, it is also possible to see the star Polaris, as well as other relevant stars. Ceremonial artifacts have been found in or near the circles, so it is thought that these places had religious importance and were used for ceremonies. Other scholars think that these places marked burial sites. In other words, that they were a kind of cemetery, since bodies have been found under or near these circles. There is also the possibility that the circles served different functions over time, and or that they were used by different types in different ways. After all, from the beginning of the Late Jomon to the beginning of the Yayoi period, around 1200 years passed. The stone circles found in Japan are unique, differing greatly from others found in the rest of East Asia. One last curious fact. Archaeologicals have found horse bones in 532 Jomon settlements dating from this period. The descendants of these horses will become the wild species of horse native to Japan, the Kizo. Mind you, just because the existence of these ancestors of the Kizo horse coincided with that of the Jomon, it doesn't mean that they were used by these communities. That would be an extrapolation. The horses are thought to have been domesticated during the Yayoi period, because the fossils found show that the horses had already increased in size by then. By the end of the Jomon era, population decline was such that the cultural homogeneity achieved during the previous phase had broken down. This occurred because population became much smaller and more dispersed, which led to the emergence of significant regional differences. Some suggest that natural forces were behind the dramatic drop in the, number of, in the number of Jomon, for example, contagious diseases. But it is also possible that this drop was simply the result of greater difficulty in obtaining resources. The climate, after all, was no longer as favorable as it had once been. Due to the fragmentation of Jomon society, separate cultures form in the north and south of Japan. Communities in the south, compared to those in the north, were less sedentary and less rigid, while more organized and structured groups form in the north. In fact, more than 50% of the archaeological sites dating back to this phase of the Jomon period are located in the north. There is also evidence, namely the quantity of ceremonial artifacts found, that the north was particularly ritualistic. Among the artifacts found are burnished ceramics and lacquered objects. The continuity of the practice of lacquer production implies that Jomon people continue to live under a system with a significant degree of sedentarism, because the process of extracting and obtaining lacquer takes months. Even so, it is difficult to say for sure where these groups position themselves on the foraging collecting continuum, because very few campsites have been found. It might be that some groups reverted to a more foraging-based system, while others continued to live almost sedentary lives. Progressively, an existing culture on the Korean peninsula, Mumu, began to affect the lives of the Jomon and other aspects of their culture, particularly in the West, which faces Korea. This influence is noticeable in the ceramics built at the time. In the second half of the final phase of the Jomon period, rice fields and dolmens appeared in northern Kyushu. It is thought that they might have been introduced by the Mumu. 
This transitional era to the Yayoi period took place approximately between 500 and 300 BC. In the deep north of Japan, rice cultivation was only introduced much later, because, as we have seen, the Jomon societies in that region were more cohesive and solid. Jomon culture survived there for much longer than elsewhere, uh, even after Japan as a whole passed into the Yayoi period. This Jomon-like society that survived the longest has been given the name Zoku Jomon, continuing Jomon or post Jomon. So yeah, this is will be all, this will be all for today. I hope that you liked the video and that it made things a bit more clearer to you. Next time, as I already said, uh, I, we will keep talking about the transitional period between the Jomon and the Yayoi. And I will also cover some other interesting topics. So looking forward to seeing you there. Goodbye. Take care.